Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started here. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Raymond. I think I've got a chance to meet most of you over the next or over the past few days, but I direct programs and membership here at WCET, and I'm really thankful that you joined us for our annual meeting. It was a, a fun and full day on the second, and now we have our first post-conference session on Don't Drown in the Lake of Data. So just a few reminders, or if this is your first session with us, we have two chat options, one on the right-hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize questions for the speaker, we'd like to use the chat feature in the blue bar for that purpose, but we'll be watching both chat and the Zoom Q&A for your questions and comments. So please participate in the session by sharing your thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking your questions. To help me moderate your questions, if you're asking a question to the speakers through Feedloop in the chat, just put a question mark symbol in front of your, your question and I'll make, it'll make it easier so I can sort through and find that. But we look forward to an active discussion. So today's session speaker is Jeff Borden and he's the Chief Academic Officer at D2L and a longtime friend of WCET. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much. I'm so, so happy to be here. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about data. You know, normally when I go out into uh, the world to talk about education or, or education technology, I'm often asked to talk about how to infuse certain kinds of assets that will engage students or, or you know, bring uh, certain kinds of outcomes to the table. And so I show things like uh, this you know, optometry test that I've been showing this for years. But what's really fascinating that a lot of people don't always realize is that every time that you click on this, you leave a trail. The, the amount of time you spend in a simulation like this leaves a trail. Everything that you click on leaves a trail. Everything you do online has some kind of profile associated with it. And that is what I really wanna talk about today, is the stuff that takes place often behind the scenes that we are trying to pay attention to or we should be paying attention to with regard to how our students are working in this environment in order to be successful. So as we talk about data, I wanna start with a data question. Now, I don't want you to answer this and you don't put it in the chat, don't, don't write down your answer. You can certainly uh, write down something on a piece of paper if you'd like to. But I just want you all to, to face the Monty Hall problem, all right, just for a moment. Now, some of you may be familiar with this. If you know the answer, then congratulations. Uh, but for, for most people, they usually don't know the answer officially, but I'll let you know by the time we're done. The Monty, Monty Hall problem was a math problem, believe it or not. And it went something like this. For those of you that don't know the show, um, let's make a deal. This was a show that ran throughout the 70s. There was a whole audience full of people and the host, Monty Hall, would go up and find somebody, pull them out of the audience and say, all right, up on the stage are three doors. Behind those three doors, uh, there are different things that you will win. Two of those things you don't want. Two of the doors are, have things you probably don't want. And one of the doors has something you very much want. In fact, he would often say, you know, behind one of those doors is a brand new car. And so he would ask the, uh, the person standing there in front of him, which door would you like to pick? And so they would listen to the crowd and everyone would get excited. And they would finally pick a door. They'd say, oh, I, I guess I'll pick door number one. Now, before the show moves on, Monty Hall would then provide what is now known as the Monty Hall problem. He would say to them, okay, you pick door number one. Before I show you if you won or not, I want to show you what's behind one of the other doors. Uh, in this case, I'm going to show you that you made at least a good choice in that you didn't pick door number three because door number three had a goat behind it. And you would have won a goat had you picked door number three. But then Monty Hall doesn't stop there. He then asks one last question. He says to the person standing there, now that you know there's a goat behind door number three, you picked door number one. Would you like to switch doors or would you like to keep? door number one. Now, at the end of our talk today, I'm going to ask you this question again. And so I would like you to give me an answer. And the answer can be one of three things. It can be number one, it is in my best interest, mathematically speaking, to stay with door number one. 
it's number two, it's in my best interest, mathematically speaking, to change to door number two. Or number three, mathematically speaking, it makes no difference whatsoever. It's a 50-50 proposition. Doesn't matter. It's the flip of a coin. So those are your three choices. Don't put anything in the chat or anything yet. We'll uh, come back and we'll talk about this as we go. But see, that is a data question. The question is actually statistical in nature. And that's what student success in this day and age can and likely should be based on. For those of you whom I haven't met, and I, I saw a few names in the, in the uh, list of people who I know, uh, this would be my word cloud. These are the, the different ed tech uh, ways to provide who I am to people. Uh, I'm a professor. I have always taught for a school somewhere since getting my master's in 1997. I have been a chief innovation officer at a university. I've been a professor, a coordinator, director. I've also been a chief academic officer for um, an old learning management system, as well as for this current LMS that I work with at D2L. But you might also notice that there's some other stuff in here. There's the fact that I'm a dad. Uh, I have some dogs. I live in Colorado. I play disc golf. I play the guitar. It's not until you take all of these disparate pieces and put them together into some sort of pattern that you start to get a sense of who this guy is that's giving you this talk today. So today, I want to talk about some of the C's of education that impact student success, that impact data. I want to talk about computation. I want to talk about how we deal with care, how we deal with communication, how we deal with context. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about creativity and how these C's can come together into a reasonable pattern so that by the time we're done talking, we can navigate those C's better together. Now, I often do that through uh, my, my sort of platform of something I call Education 3.0, which has to do with cognitive science, learning design, and how those can be supported by education technology. But today, I'm going to try to look at all of those in terms of the data trail that they lead and how we can and probably should begin to use what we know about the brain, what we know about people, what we know about psychology when it comes to student success. I often go around, as I said before, and I talk about all of these sorts of things with regularity. But today I wanna specifically talk about some of the things that are found in a couple of the different chapters in books that I have out there. The, uh, the book on the science, the chapter is called The Science and Technology of Interconnectedness and some information in the Education 3.0 and e-learning across modalities. I'm going to try to bring that to bear as we talk about these three things. I want to talk about the problems with data. Uh, we have some issues with how we use data, with how we've sort of built up data. Then I want to talk about the current data sets that we tend to use, the typical measures that we have today in higher ed. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we probably should analyze instead. So that's kind of where we're headed uh, for the next 50 minutes or so. To start, I want to spoil a movie. <laughs> I hope you've all seen this. I hope that this is not a huge spoiler for you. Um, the movie Endgame was massive. It was you know, the biggest blockbuster of its time. All sorts of people went to see it. It was one of the, the last big movies that came out before the pandemic started. And man, did it, did it really make a, uh, an impact. Well, I'm a huge Marvel fan. Uh, some of you, again, know me, know that I, I've been collecting Spider-Man comics since I was very, very young. But my daughter is also a Marvel fan. And we thought that something was very interesting. When we went to the Infinity War, which was the movie that led up to the Endgame, uh, we were actually a little disappointed as we walked out of that movie theater. Now, I'm sorry if you haven't seen it. I'm, I'm going to spoil it. But I'm assuming now, you know, this many years later, it's OK. At the end, when that bad guy gets the glove that allows him to snap his fingers and destroy uh, half of all living things, and he even destroys my beloved Spider-Man, it's really interesting because as we, we got up from that movie and everyone was unsettled, there were people crying in the theater. My daughter looked up at me and said, Dad, I understand that he, he didn't think that there was enough assets or resources in the universe to, to, to handle all of the, the beings. But why didn't he, when he snapped his fingers and made half of all living creatures disappear, why didn't he make the people who were left behind forget? Just forget about what they had lost so that they wouldn't be sad for the rest of their lives. They wouldn't be depressed for the rest of their lives. Uh, children wouldn't lose their parents. Parents wouldn't lose their children. 
why, why didn't he do that? And we started to explore that and talk about it. And eventually we, we both came to the, the really massive conclusion. Why didn't he just snap his fingers and create twice as much stuff? Why didn't he just add more resources? It seemed to be a pretty fundamental flaw in the thinking that went into it. But see, as my Spider-Man would always say, with great power comes great responsibility. The same holds true with data. I think that there are times that we create problems based on the data we choose to look at rather than looking at the data we should look at. Uh, I think I can give you a pretty good illustration of this based on Target. Now, some of you may have heard this story before. I'll, I'll try to do it quickly. But back, uh, oh, almost seven or eight years ago, Target hired some statisticians, some psychometricians, and they basically said, look, we've got all this data and we would really like for people to just start looking through the data to see if there's any sense we can make of it, if there's any trends we can follow, and if there's anything that we should be doing. And so sure enough, Dr. Pohl and some of uh, Dr. Pohl's uh, reports went, started plugging through the data and they found sure enough, there were certain things that you know, they could start selling at, at certain seasons, even before the seasons happened. This uh, led to them starting to put certain kinds of merchandise out much earlier than Target had ever put it out before, things like that. But in the midst of all this, they came across something that is pretty interesting. They found that women who had been purchasing stuff at Target, and they knew this because of credit cards and some, some had accounts, but they really were able to, to triangulate this based on credit cards. They found that when those women would then register for the, the, uh, their babies because they were, they were pregnant, and so they would go on the baby registry, they actually then found that for the 20 weeks leading up to that, those women had engaged in behavior that was unusual. They had actually started buying different kinds of things. Primarily, the big one that really caught their attention was lotion. These women started buying lotion that was unscented. Now, presumably, they didn't even know they were pregnant yet, but for some reason, they realized that scented lotion was not good for them. In fact, Dr. Pohl found that not only during that 20 weeks did they buy unscented lotion, they, they started buying 25 other kinds of products, again, perhaps even not knowing that they were pregnant. And as the researchers started to, to look into this, this data, they realized they could, with tremendous accuracy, determine that a woman was pregnant and get within two weeks of her actual due date almost 90% of the time accurately. So they started doing something interesting. They started sending out coupons to women who were exhibiting this behavior. They started sending out baby diapers and baby lotions and baby creams and formula coupons for those things to individual people because they had a pretty good idea that those women were pregnant, even if the women themselves didn't know they were pregnant. Well, this led to a little bit of controversy. There was a father of a 16-year-old who came into a Target irate, furious, because his daughter had been sent coupons for diapers and baby creams and baby lotions. And he was incensed because she was only 16. And what was Target doing? Sending this kind of, of paraphernalia to his child. He was so mad. And the, the, the manager of the Target was apologizing and trying to figure out if there was a way to make amends. And then interestingly, a couple of days later, that man sent an email to the manager. He said, I had a talk with my daughter. It turns out there have been some activities in my house I haven't been completely aware of. She's due in August. I owe you an apology. What we do with data is important. It's a lot of power. And so it takes a bit of responsibility. When I read that, I thought of something that at the time I was dealing with. See, at the other learning management company that I was working with, we used to do all sorts of analytics. And one of the analytics that we used to uh, do for some of our, our partners was around retention and completion and persistence. And one of those, one of those uh, retention efforts looked something like you see here. We could tell you which programs had the highest enrollments and at the same time, which programs had the highest drop rates. Now that's a place for some schools to find an opportunity to say, you know what, we really need to work with the management program or the business program or the accounting program and make sure that um, we're, we're working with them to try to get those persistence rates at least up to the average completion rate. 
that would that would that would drive revenue that would save jobs that would that would help us with all sorts of stuff but there were some schools that we went to that we showed this exact uh, map to and they said no you can't show that to us we can't have that kind of analysis done there are rules that govern us. The faculty senate says you can't look at retention rates for programs, or um, we've got a, a specific element in our contract. There's academic freedom. We can't do that. We don't want to know if that's happening or not happening. And so there's a question of whether it's useful or unusable. But that doesn't change the fact that we are seeing trouble when it comes to student success. Now, before the pandemic, completion rates were rough. I mean, if you start looking by sector, you, you start to notice the average, in the, at least in North America, the average re completion rate is somewhere in the range of around 55 to 60%, depending on what metric you're looking at. But even since the pandemic, man, things have really tanked with regard to people persisting in. So numerically, you can look at the, the number of people who start in college versus the number of people who finish in college. And those numbers are really quite poor. But I know that there are some people who say it's not about those numbers, it's about the experience of those who do finish. It's about the learning that takes place, the critical thinking that takes place, all the, all the possibilities of things that, that will be better for those folks. But there again, the news isn't good. Article after article, book after book, research study after study shows that people in college are not measurably learning, finding the ability to be creative, changing their ability to think critically, adding their abilities to, to solve problems. They, they don't know job skills. They can't transfer ideas from one context to another context. If you look at these books, you start to see, in fact, you don't have to go any further than Brian Kaplan's The Case Against Education, where he shows meta study after meta study after meta study of students who got an A on a final, and then were asked to take that final again six months later, but without the knowledge that it was coming. They couldn't cram, they couldn't study. And so they ended up getting a 55, 56, 57%. The same score as a student who'd never took that class at all. Our students aren't really coming through the process having learned much of anything other than how to cram. And so it becomes quite problematic. So regardless of your definition of student success, whether it's, whether it's just the persistence numbers or it's the outcomes of the students themselves, I think we, if we're going to fix it, we've got to start looking at what the root problems actually are. Now, I think if you want to really get a great handle on student success, you want to think associatively. You want to think like people outside of our sector think. These eight books would be an excellent primer, an excellent place to begin. But specifically, I want to talk about Todd Rose's The End of Average for a moment because I think he nails on the head exactly what some of the root problems are that we're dealing with Sometimes I think we don't even realize that we're trying to overcome these things. When he talks about the end of average, he talks about how we tend to average people and what a mistake that is. Now, that story actually goes back to the mid 1800s when a man named Catelet, who was uh, attempting to be an astronomer over in the Netherlands, but he couldn't because of a civil war that was taking place. They couldn't get the observatory built and he couldn't get his telescope in place. But he was grounded in statistics and math. Uh, if, if you don't know how astronomers used to determine the speed, ex for example, of, a, of a, uh, a Mercury or Venus going across their telescope, they would etch two lines in their telescope and they would start a stopwatch as soon as Mercury hit one side and they would wait till it to get to the other side and they would hit their watch. But because telescopes were also different, there were just, there was tiny discrepancies in the amount of time that it took so what the astronomers did was they started collecting and aggregating all of their data and then averaging them out. And the closer that they, the, the more average numbers they put in there, the, the more averaging they got, the closer they were to perfection. And so Catelet started doing this with people because for the first time we had access to data about people. Governments were starting to collect data. Towns, municipalities, uh, kings and queens were starting to ask for data about their people. And Catelet was one of the very first people to ever say, I can do something with that data. I can tell you that there's an average birth rate each year. There's an average death rate each year. There's an average suicide rate each year. And he started going in and finding all these things that people did not have any idea were statistical. 
they, they had no idea that, that there was the same basic average number of people who killed themselves every year. They said that that's impossible. And he said, no, I can prove it. And he showed people with math and math and math. Now he was invited to different kingdoms, countries by kings and queens, presidents, provo uh, presidents and, and politicians. They used to bring him in just to help them categorize their people. And Catelet influenced an entire generation of thinker. The people who basically created the Industrial Revolution were fans, huge fans of Catelet but with one major difference. They bought into the notion that you could striate people and put them in clusters and categories, but what they didn't like was the notion that average meant perfect. They, they started taking the idea and saying, no, no, we want better than average. We want beyond average. We want people who are above average. That's how they wanted to build their manufacturing systems. That's how they wanted to build out society in ways that showed who was better than whom. That's why Galton fam famously said, people who are superior at one thing are typically superior at many things, whereas imbecility in one general area signals general imbecility. <laughs> if you're an idiot in one place, you're probably an idiot everywhere else. They liked the idea of who was smart and who was dumb, who was good and who was bad, who was rich and who was poor. They liked that. And so they began to work to create our societal fabric. That included school. And so guys like Rockefeller, who, again, were trying to build their factories with, with better and better workers, they were very much believers in school. But note, they weren't interested in school for the sake of education. They weren't interested in school for problem solving or critical thinking, not at all. They wanted school to design better workers. He said this famously after he created the General Education Board, when he said, look, we're not trying to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or science. The task that we've set before ourselves is very simple as well as very beautiful. We will organize our children into a little community and teach them to do in a perfect way the things their fathers and mothers are doing in an imperfect way. He wanted school very much, but he wanted it to teach people how to sit still and, and be quiet and take orders. And he had the ear of people like the president, Woodrow Wilson, who was one of the first architects of, of, of the biggest public school boom that our country had ever seen. And this is what he said just before he became president. We want one class of persons to have a liberal education. We want another class of persons, a very much larger class of necessity in every society, to forego the privilege of a liberal education and to fit themselves to perform difficult manual tasks. We want to take the average person and make them a worker, not a thinker, not someone who's smart, but somebody who can follow orders and do it well. And so he handed the keys over to guys like Elwood Coverley. Coverley de designed the first dozen or so school districts in our country, starting in Ohio. And as he designed these places, he's, he, he designed them very specifically so that certain things would come out of it. Now pay very close attention to what Coverley said they wanted to do with schools. All focus must remain at the front for the teacher, the chalkboard, and the information, with students in rows quietly reading books and absorbing information, only speaking when spoken to, and only taking breaks when bells ring. Promoting isolation and fear will create the working class American needs. That's how school was designed, to create isolation and fear by putting people in individual desks not able to talk to anyone else, not able to look at anyone else. And the only thing that brought them safety and security was the manager at the front of the room or the bells that rang that told them it's finally time to take a break. That's how school was designed. That's how schools were architected. And interestingly, as I travel the world looking at schools today, whether it's in K through 12 or higher ed, graduate school, undergrad, doesn't seem to matter, community college, we are seeing classrooms built exactly like this and staying exactly like this. Be quiet, sit still, and learn. There's a couple of fundamental problems here, and I hope you can see them. I hope you agree. We, we've got some root cause issues. Let's start with this notion of averages. Let's start with the idea of averagearianism, all right? Here's what I want to do. Uh, I, want to, I, want to, I want to give you a little average test. Now, if we've got, uh, I don't know, 60 or so people in here, then we should see a nice bell curve. So 40 or so of you should be 
all average when it comes to the average American. Let's see if that's true, okay? What I want you to do is in the chat, I just want you to type if you're in, okay? Type if you're in, and the first time that you're out, go ahead and type out. After that, you don't have to type it again. So just type in or out based on whether this applies to you, okay? So for the first thing, let's see, if you're an American male and you're five foot nine to 5'11", type in. If you're a female and you're five foot four to five foot six, type in. Otherwise, type out. Now, if you typed out, you're done. You don't have to do anything else, okay? Very good, I'm seeing a lot of you, wow. Now, how is it we're having so many out already? That's interesting, we're all average, aren't we? Let's keep going. For those of you who sit in, if your shoe size is a 10 to 11 as a male or an eight and a half to a nine and a half as a female, then type in. Otherwise, if you're newly out, type out. Oh, I'm seeing a couple. We've got four, maybe five that are still in. All right, let's try weight. For a male, if you're 193 to 198 pounds, then you're in. If you're a female, if you're 165 to 170, then you're in. Otherwise, type out. Oh no, I am seeing a lot of outs. In fact, I'm seeing only outs at this point. Now, how's that possible? These are averages. This is what the average American should look like, should act like, should, should be like, but that's not the case. And, and I didn't even get to your eye color, your household income, how much money is in your wallet right now, why? Because there's really no such thing as averages when it comes to people. And this is the easy stuff. I didn't get to the hard stuff, like your psychographics. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in the death penalty? Do you believe in evolution? I didn't even ask you some of that tough stuff. This is the problem with averagearian thinking. Now, it's not like we don't know this. It's just that we don't tend to care. Back in the 50s, the Air Force discovered this firsthand. They were losing planes one after the other. Multi-million dollar machines were falling out of the sky because of pilot error all over the place. And, and they couldn't figure it out. They, they couldn't, couldn't figure out why. They really had to fix this. Well, finally, somebody at the Air Force said, I suspect maybe it's because we haven't redesigned the cockpit since World War I. And pilots have changed. They've grown, they're taller, they're lankier, whatever. Let's, let's design a better average cockpit. And so they grabbed all of the pilots, all 4,000 plus of those, of those pilots, and they measured seven different measures, their arm length, their torso length, uh, all these different things so that they could, they could configure the best possible cockpit. After doing that, they then tried to apply those measurements to people to see how many of them they could find that were close to the average. After they averaged those seven things, none of those 4,000 pilots had all seven as an average. None of them had six. None of them had five. None of them had four. It wasn't until they got down to three that they found clusters of three people, three pilots, who had three of the averages in, in similarity. Why? Because the Air Force soon realized there's no such thing as an average pilot. Now, what did they do with that? Well, they told the makers of these planes, you've got to create cockpits that are adjustable with seats that will rack back and with mirrors that are adjustable, stuff that we take for granted today in our cars. But at the time, the people who were building those planes screamed from the rooftops, this is gonna cost way too much money. It's never gonna happen, that's impossible. And then they soon figured it out and they sold all sorts of planes to the Air Force. You see, what we have gotten wrong, what Katzelay got wrong, is this concept of, of something called ergodic theory. Ergodic theory, as any chemist out there will tell you, basically says, if you want to compare two things as average, then those two things have to not only be the same, but they're going to have to stay the same. They're gonna to have to be the same as each other and stay the same as each other. Well, that's certainly not true of people. We are wildly different in every way, shape or form. We're different physically, we're different emotionally, we're different in how we think, we're different in how we feel, we're different. So if I were to ask you which one of these men is bigger and which one is average, it's a stupid question. It's a ludicrous question. You can't answer it. Even if I were to give you the, the measures to, to help you, it doesn't make any difference. We are people. We're not average. There's no such thing. 
And yet we average students all the time, all the time. We talk about students being average. We create bell curves for tests. We create bell curves for thought, for GPA, for grades, even though our students are wildly different at different things all the time. They're better at some stuff than other stuff. They're better in the mornings than at night. Some are better at night than in the mornings. Some are better in groups. Some are better individually. None of that matters. We say everybody must learn the exact same way. And if you do, then I can test you. And that's where I'm going to get this good score. The average student is a myth, which, by the way, should give you not only a little bit of pause, but it should also give you a little bit of hope. Because if the average student is a myth, then the average teacher is a myth. Just as silly as the president or principal who stands up and says, we've got the best teachers of all time. All of our teachers are amazing. Everyone knows that's not true. That's just marketing spin and marketing speak. You can't possibly have all the best teachers at your school. But similarly, you can't have a bunch of average teachers either because there's no such thing. It doesn't exist. There's no average student. There's no average teacher. There's no average school. These US News and World Report rankings mean nothing unless you're on them and then you like it, right? As you start to look at how we have set up our entire underpinning of student success, it's based on a concept of averages, of averaging humans, which mathematically is wrong. You can't do it. This is why I, I think so often of Dan Pink's quote that he said in the book Drive. When he said, you know, there's a significant gap between what scientists know about how our brains work and what organizational behaviorists will tell you that our institutions do. We know so much more about success. We know so much more about math. We know so much more about learning. We know so much more about so many things. And yet we still act as if we didn't know any of that stuff. We're still doing things we did 100 years ago as we move forward. The other quote that this makes me think of is an old boss of mine who said, you know what? It's all, it always comes down to time, cost, and quality. Pick two, because you'll never get all three. And so as I think about the student success concept, the data that we pull, I think about time. Do you know how much time it would take to pull data that would really help teachers in the moment? To do semantic analysis like you see here, so that you could literally start to see the words that are being used in the classrooms by the teacher, by the students, or they're being typed in into different places. Do you realize how helpful this would be to see, wow, students are not getting what I thought they were getting, or they're, they're, they're writing down exactly what I thought they would write down. We don't do that. Why? Time. It takes so much time. It would be so much heavy lifting. So we let that go. Let's go on to cost. My dissertation was in the correct size of an online classroom for student success. Student success being completion and grade. And what I found was very interesting. Now this was, this was a number of years ago. This was a decade or more ago. And the, the class size that was being lauded at the time was 17. Everyone was saying 17 is the number you should have. Well, the, the data doesn't really flesh out that way. The data would suggest that you want to have between 26 and 34 if you actually want to have the best completion rates. You've got subgroups that, that form and all sorts of things. Um, that's in my published dis dissertation. You can go find it if you want to. But that's the number. It's not 50 and it's not 15. It's 26 to 34. That's really what you want. But now we've got a cost issue, right? Because those classes that are usually 50 or 100 or 700 or 1,000 well, that's a much, much more difficult thing to pay for, isn't it? All those teachers that you need. Similarly, you now have teachers who are saying, I won't teach more than 20 because I can't do the homework. I can't keep up with the work. I can't keep up with the stuff. So you've got a definite cost issue when it comes to that. Then you've got quality. I think back to the, the work that we were doing again at my old LMS when we actually started looking to see who was paying attention to grade comments. And it's very interesting to me, if a student gets 100 on, on, a, on a grade, 99 times out of 100, they don't look at the comments. They don't care. So teachers who are writing diligent, big, copious notes in the, into their students, telling them all sorts of feedback, 99 times out of 100, if the, if the stu student got 100%, they don't even see it. At the same time, however, you've got students who are in other swaths that are, that are reading those comments, uh, especially the B and C students, but the D and F students, again, not reading quite so much. Now, 
How does that impact us? Well, at some schools, you've got teachers who write no feedback ever. So it doesn't really matter if the students are trying to find it, they don't get it. At the same time, you've got other schools that require teachers to write feedback. And so they're writing all this copious feedback to students who aren't even paying attention to it. Is that a good use of our time? Time, cost, quality. <laughs> what are we gonna pick? See, I think it comes down to the notion that we've gotta be much more careful about what we're measuring. We're not necessarily measuring all the best stuff. This guy right here, his name is David Ogilvy. David, David Ogilvy surveyed and measured more humans than any other person alive, it is estimated. He was sort of the, the godfather of marketing over in Great Britain for years before he passed away. And he surveyed person after person after person by phone, uh, in malls, in, by the post. He, he surveyed tons and tons of people. And basically, at the end of his life, just before he died, he saw the, the results of, of one particular study. And he said this statement. Now think about how, how telling this statement is. People don't think how they feel. They don't say what they think. And they don't do what they say. He basically undermined surveys in one fell swoop, something that had been his lifeblood for his entire life. He said, it's all a waste of time. Or as my mom would have said, actions speak louder than words, that it doesn't matter what people say, it only matters what people do. Now, let me tell you the study that he was reacting to. There was a study where they brought some people into a, uh, a space and they put an fMRI helmet on them and they asked them to watch TV. And they just wanted to see what they did when they watched television. Now, important to this conversation is a marketing concept of, around commercials. Do you guys know which commercial is the most expensive commercial in any commercial set? Uh, put it in the chat if you think you know. Is it the first one? Is it the last one? Is it the middle one? Is it the second one? Is it the second to last one? Does anybody have a guess as to which commercial they will charge people the most for? Okay, six, you think two, all right. Second one, yeah, seeing on TV, good. Three, two, all right. Oh, Adidas, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go with the brand. The actual number is number one. The first commercial has always been the most expensive commercial to buy uh, for any commercial set. That's the one that they, that's sort of the glamorous one they try to sell uh, the, the big spot to. Now, why do they do that? They do that because as we have surveyed people over time and asked them if they remember the commercials, the first commercial is the one they remember the most. They remember the first commercial by far the best. But the study that David Ogilvy was, was responding to was again around the brain, uh, starting to measure and map the brain. And when people were watching commercials uh, in the middle of their TV shows that they wanted to watch, the part of the brain that lit up was not the part that just was for memory. It was the part that made them angry or sad. <laughs> in other words, for 50 years, we have been charging people the most money for the commercial that ticks them off the most. It ruined the show. It took away their show. They want to watch the show. They don't want to watch the commercial. And we charged people the most for that commercial that made people upset. We often do what's easy, not necessarily what's important or what's best. I would argue that we do the same thing in higher education when it comes to student success. How do we intervene? Well, we call Civitas or EAB or Helio or Starfish or one of those other systems that does forensic work. And it goes in and it looks for students as they're bubbling along, getting their grades, and it waits for them to have a drop of a significance or to go below a certain threshold with their grade. But the problem, of course, as we all know, is that means that professors have to be up to date on all of their grades. In fact, if you're not immediate with your grades, then you're going to see that as a lagging indicator. That lagging indicator in some cases can be a month. It's typically about two weeks. By the time that a student has started to go downhill and those systems ping you to tell you that they're in trouble, that's when you're going to see action. You're gonna see most students who are unwilling to fix it. They're ready to drop. They're ready to go. They're ready to be done. Because we're only looking at their cognitive abilities. We're only looking at those grades. That's all we're focusing on. 
That's what we focus on in higher ed, right? We focus on their grades. We focus on maybe a survey here or there, an end of course evaluation. And we, and we focus on tests, the tests that they take, the pre-tests they take, the post-tests they take, the midterms, the finals. That's what we study. And that's what we determine is successful or not successful. We could measure a person's grit. We could determine if they feel like they can push through problem areas. We could measure their motivation. We could measure what they search for when they're given an assignment. We could even measure what they write down in their notes, but we don't. We don't do any of that stuff. Now, granted, 50 years ago, that would have been very difficult. Most of this would have been hard, but today it's not hard at all. But yet we still measure the old stuff. We could measure the pathways that people come into in an LMS and see where they go first, where they go second, where they go third, where they go fourth. We could see the order of operations that they take. We could see how often they click on the grade book. We could see how often they click on email. We could see how often they click on a course homepage. We could look at outcomes, not grades, but did they get the competencies? Did they get the standards? Did they actually get it? We could see in this case that Jennifer is struggling with all of her outcomes, but at the same time, the entire class seems to be struggling with that third outcome. So maybe that's an issue of how we've instructed it. We could do that, but we don't. What I'm going to to propose to you for the rest of our time together is that we begin measuring the whole learner. In order to measure the whole learner, we have to know some new concepts. I wanna ask you one more time in the chat to post something. And I'm gonna ask you to do something I never ask people to do. I'm gonna ask you not to Google what I'm about to say to you, okay? I know you're at computers, you're at phones, you've got all your equipment. I want you to just out of the top of your head, answer this. And I know there are a few people who've heard me talk before. If you know the answer uh, because of one of my talks, don't answer it. But if you know it for your own reasons, then go ahead. I would like you to please define for us the word conation. So please write in the chat what you believe the word conation means. Any guesses? Now, can you spell it? I'm going to tell you, Denise, I'm not going to tell you how to spell it for a very specific reason. I'll show you here in just a minute. So Megan says implied meaning. What is understood? Okay. Consideration. All right. Interesting. Interesting. Let me just look at one more. Anybody else got a, got a guess? A derivative of connote. Okay. Actually, none of those is correct. Now, don't feel badly. This word is actually on a list of the thousand least used words of the English language. <laughs> I'm going to suggest to you, though, that as educators, we want to try to bring it back. Now, what you just went through to try to figure that out is a, is a whole neuroscience lesson in and of itself. But basically, for 45 seconds, you all will spend time trying to figure out the meaning of that word. You'll try to spell it in your head. That's why I didn't tell you how to spell it. You will try to say it out loud. You'll try to use it in a, word, in a sentence. You'll try to see, see if it sounds like something else. You'll look for prefixes, suffixes. And eventually, you'll come to the conclusion that you don't know what it means. Just like students who are sitting in a lecture when a professor uses a word that they don't know, they will wander off mentally for up to 45 seconds trying to figure out what that word means. And while they're trying to figure it out, they will lose another 200 to 400 words of whatever that person has said. There's all kinds of reasons that we got to be very careful about how we attack education. But that aside, let's talk about what the word actually means, okay? I'm going to talk to you now about the learning triangle. This is in one of those chapters I referred to at the very beginning. Um, there's a lot of description in there uh, about this. The learning triangle is something that, that has been around for over 100 years, and there are different iterations of it. But here's, here's the iteration that I tend to uh, use as a framework for my teaching and learning. At the top of the learning triangle is cognition. As I've already tried to point out, we spend almost all of our time worrying about, focusing on, measuring, treating cognition. Tests, scores, grades, all of those things that really are proxies for learning, we have gotten to the place where we just say that's learning. If a person gets an A, then we believe they have learned. Doesn't matter if they were lucky, doesn't matter if they guessed, doesn't matter if the, the measurement was too subjective. If they get an A, we have just come to the conclusion that they have learned something. So that's cognition. 
That's where we spend the majority of our time worrying about student success. However, in the lower left-hand corner is something called affection. We have known for years, decades, the power of being connected. We now know through neuroscience that there's all sorts of reasons that people who aren't connected cannot learn. People who don't feel that they have friends, people who don't feel that they have support networks, feel that they don't have relationships, people who don't feel cared for, people who don't feel loved, they have no affection. And for some people in the population, about a third of our students, if they don't have affection, it doesn't matter if they come into the classroom, they are unable to learn. As you're probably ahead of me, you can see in the lower right-hand corner then is conation. Conation is, in the last at least couple of decades, it's often replaced with words like grit or mindset or uh, tenacity, resilience, but it really is best described as all of those things rolled up into one. Conation is directed effort. Yes, it's volition, Steve, that's right. It is really the, the ability for us to believe in ourselves and to move forward in doing what we believe we can do. When we start to look at these other two elements of the learning triangle, we start to see some, some really important and chilling things. Students are leaving college because they're lonely. Before the pandemic, 7% of students that left college reported having left because they were lonely. These were not online students. These were students surrounded by people all the time, and they felt alone. And by feeling alone, they felt like they couldn't do. People are lonely. Uh, an ex-colleague of mine um, who I used to work with we went to Columbia. This is how he tried to connect at Columbia. The only part of this tool set that he that 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 he had that Columbia actually had impact on was the LMS and Zoom. Everything else he did of his own volition. He tried to connect pe to people via LinkedIn, via Twitter, via Wakelet, via some other apps that he was trying to use. He tried to find just meaningful ways to connect to people. We know from a neuroscientific perspective that when you connect to other people, your brain creates a neurotransmitter called oxytocin. That when you create oxytocin, it's kind of like grease for your engine. It allows you to take information from others. It allows you to learn from experts. It allows you to learn from peers. When you're not producing oxytocin, if you're in a place where you need connection, you're probably then producing the other neurotransmitter, glutamate. Glutamate actually is a stress hormone. It's an excitatory hormone that comes out when you're in times of stress, and it eats neurons. It literally eats the things you need in order to think. We know that people need connection. Michael D. Stollard writes about this in his book. A deficiency of connection makes people feel unsupported, left out, or lonely. When we feel disconnected, our bodies move into a state called stress response, which triggers a fight or flight readiness. That's fine if we're facing a short-term threat, but actually shortens our life lifespan when perpetual. But many schools are under enormous financial pressure to do more with fewer resources to support more students. This reality contributes to a drift toward indifference on campuses because people are so busy that they don't take time to develop supportive relationships. If your school is of the opinion that they just don't have time to deal with whether their students have friends, they're wrong. They've made a massive mistake. And they're, they're completely ignoring one third of the students who are struggling in terms of the student success equation. Look at what our students are asking for out of the pandemic. They want ways to connect. They want people to connect to. They want ways digitally to connect to clubs. They want digital ways to connect to people. They want digital ways to have study programs. They want resources available to them in, across all modalities. Bharat Anand says it so well in the content trap. It's not about content. It's not about teaching better. It's not about better classes. It's not, not about better content. It never has been and never will be. The organizations that thrive are those that connect people to other people. When I was at St. Leo, we tried to build a system that would allow people to connect, not just to the tools they needed, like a portal, but also to the groups that they wanted to join or groups that we thought they should join. We could put them in groups or they could join groups of their own volition. This tool was available to students across any, uh, any device, across all modalities. It's, it's a tool called PATH. If you wanna go look at them, they're fantastic, but it really does allow people to connect. But we didn't end there. 
while we created a place where we could put all majors, we could put people in military groups or they could join uh, you know, ultimate Frisbee groups if they wanted to, we also started to infuse into that discourse analytics. Now, Discourse Analytics is this fascinating company that starts to measure conation. They start to look at your students and ask, what's your motivation? What's your resiliency score? How are you in terms of your social intelligence? And they start to capture this information. It's not based on the, the typical demographic stuff that everybody else seems to, to need to look at. They're looking at people as individuals. And here's the best part. They're not saying, I want to look at you and compare you to the average. They're able to start saying, I want to look at you and compare you to you. I want to see if your behavior changes over time. They're starting to look at people's belief, at their volition, at their mindset. I don't know if you can fill in this blank. I hope not. But if you have the I'm not a blank person, if you can fill that in, you need to read Carol Dweck's mindset. Because there are a lot of people out there who believe I'm not a numbers person. I'm not a technology person. I'm not a language person. I, I can't learn this stuff. And that's just wrong. There's no such thing as a person who can't learn something unless they have some sort of learning disability. But if you want to learn numbers, you can learn numbers. If you want to learn literacy, you can learn literacy. If you want to learn numeracy, you can learn numeracy. Carol Dweck puts it so well in mindset. This, in her research, is a better predictor of success than any other measure that we have, any one. As you start to look at, though, what teachers know about mindset, very few professors feel comfortable teaching in a way that embodies and embraces mindset. Not only are they not sure if they can do it well, they're really sure that their colleagues can't do it well. And that doesn't bode well for students. You know, the whole country of Australia re-changed re their entire curriculum so that K through 11 does a mindset-based curriculum. But then they go back in year 12 and they start teaching by rote memorization and testing. Why? Because that's the kind of world the students are going to graduate into in college. They're not expected to learn information. They're expected to memorize for short periods of time and then purge it. Similarly, you can look at Angela Duckworth and some of the work being done out of the University of Pennsylvania talking about grit. She also believes grit scores are a more relevant score for a student's success. But you know what we're seeing? We're talking about the whole person. We're talking about people who some have cognitive needs, yes but some have affective needs and some have cognitive needs. And when you get all of those together, you start to, to create an index of success that actually makes a difference. You can start to intervene much, much sooner. You don't have to wait for somebody's grades to drop and for them to feel like it's too late, I've got to leave. You don't have to do that. You can literally start to find people who say, I'm lonely. I don't believe in myself. I don't have these feelings that I can get through. Now, once you do that, you're gonna to start to hear some interesting stories. One of my favorite stories came from a student who was the first in family to attend our university. And basically what she said was, when I go home and I say things to my parents, like I've got a professor who I don't think likes me very much. I've got some content in a course I don't think I, I, I know how to learn. I, I've got a, a subject that's really difficult for me to get my head around. Her family's response to that was, well, we're not college material in this family. That's how it works. You should probably drop out and come get a job. We were able to get in front of her because we found out that she was having problems with belief. She was having problems feeling like she had connected to study groups and other things like that. And we were able to say to her, you know what? Everybody feels like there's a professor at some point who doesn't like them. You can get through this. Here are some tools, some techniques, some, some, some tricks. Yes, you're going to feel like there are certain classes you can't get through. That's okay. We've got study halls for you. We've got, we've got um, people to go to to tutor you, people to go to to, to get academic help. We've got different pr uh, programs in the library that you can, you can attend. We've got people that you can join. And as soon as you do that, well, the world starts to open up. You can start to measure other things that are just as important. We should be measuring confidence in our students, not just if they answer a test question correctly, but did they believe that they, were, that they answered that test question correctly? Because as you can see from this little chart, 
If a person believes they answered something correctly and they're wrong, they've got some unlearning to do. They have to do unlearning and relearning. And that's one of the hardest things we have in all of education. Wouldn't you like to know that so we can actually help students learn? We can measure how much they study and what they study. We can start measuring if they're connected to other people, how many connections they've made, those linkages that they have, how much time they spend in those linkages. You know, Richard Light told us so many years ago when he studied from 1990 to 2000, interviewing thousands of students up and down the Eastern Seaboard in community colleges, R1s, Ivy Leagues, everywhere. He found that the number one promoter of success was if they joined a group outside of class. Basically, they created a little academic family for themselves where they could study together, yes, but they could also talk about non-study things. They could talk about books or movies or TV shows or things going on on campus, or they could talk about sports, whatever they wanted. Students who joined those groups were more successful than students who did not, significantly. We can start to measure non-cognitive academic factors. We can start to look at students who have test anxiety and help them. We can start to look at whether they're actually bringing in metacognition and self-reflection so that they can understand what's happening or not. The most telling quote that I have to leave you with is this. That system I showed you that we, that we implemented at St. Leo called PATH, I worked with those guys for a while. We went to a state to try to say to them, hey, would this be interesting to you in your K through 12 organization? And their response that we got from the Department of Education Secretary of Ed for the state was this. Wow, this product solves at least 100 problems, but if you can't show how it boosts a test score, our state will never buy it because we only seem to focus on cognition. If you wanna focus on student success and get to the data that matters, look at how many connections people are making with other people. Look at their belief in self. See what we can do with affection and conation. So as we look at whether or not we should make different decisions, let's go back to the Monty High problem. This is a math problem. It's a statistics problem. So if you recall, we've seen the doors, we picked door number one, the goat was behind door number three, and Monty Hall asks that question, should you switch? Now is your chance to answer in the chat. Yes, it's mathematically in my interest to switch. No, it's not mathematically in my interest to switch, or it doesn't matter, it's a 50-50 proposition. What do you guys think? Doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. No, I wouldn't switch, no. Door number one is a new car. All right, let's see. The actual mathematical answer is you should switch. After you switch, you have actually changed your odds from 50-50 to two out of three. Now, I don't have time to explain this as we only have 60 seconds left, but I would encourage you to go look at the Wikipedia entry about the Monty Hall problem. Not only will you see the answer and see how it's configured, but take note at the gender equality hook that might be an interesting way to start to get some of your students interested in some of these sorts of math problems. It's about a, an expert mathematician who was a woman who wrote this answer in a publication long ago and was corrected by men who were telling her, oh, honey, you're just a woman. You don't understand how to do math when she was right. <laughs> so it's a fascinating story. I highly recommend it. But of course, the answer is yes, you should switch. When we do all this stuff right, we will find student success at the end. And it will not just be completion rates. It will be students who have learned. It will be students who care. It will be students who are curious. It will be students who are lifelong learners. That's what we start to focus on in this sea of data as we navigate those seas together. Thank you so much for your time. I would love to hear from you after. If you have questions, please send them to me. I'm sending this deck to WCET and they can send it out to any of you if you want it, uh, be well. Jeff, thank you so much, really appreciate it. Always interesting, I learned a lot, took lots of notes. There was a question that came in through Zoom and I'll make sure to send that to you. So thank okay. you for joining us, everybody. Take care. Have a good afternoon.